proposal to convert the old barracks into an asylum, there was again opposition to the move. But generally speaking, it was much more subdued than it had been in 1866. The Newcastle Chronicle again voiced its opposition, arguing that Bolton Street should be extended to Ordnance Street, and the eastern side of the parade grounds turned into public recreation grounds or divided into allotments and sold. The paper believed the barracks was an obstacle to Newcastle's expansion and likened the, and likened the city of Newcastle to what it uh, called a Chinese lady's foot, cramped and unable to expand. <laughs> As a consequence, it is fast becoming deformed. However, in 1871, the government was determined to relieve the overcrowding at its existing asylums. The Sydney press suggested that Novocastrians, who protested against having what it described as harmless imbeciles housed in their midst, should themselves be incarcerated in an asylum. <laughs> the first 100 patients who came from the Parramatta Asylum arrived in Newcastle in September of 1871. Over the next 25 years, under the direction of Frederick Norton Manning, the first Inspector General of what was then called the Department of Lunacy, the former barracks were to be adapted to meet what he and other mental health experts of the period believed were the needs of the inmates. Manning was deeply influenced by what was known as the moral therapy movement, which according to Stephen Garton, quote, stressed the importance of physical, material and moral aspects of the asylum environment in the treatment of the insane. By the mid-19th century, a central focus of asylum reform was architecture, where emphasis was placed on the proper organisation of space to facilitate classification and distribution of patients in a way that ensured the effectiveness of moral reconstruction. Unquote. I hope you all got that. <laughs> the former officers' quarters became the women's dormitory. The men were housed in the former soldiers' barracks. In 1873, colonial architect James <laughs> Barnett, who shared Manning's moral therapy philosophy, drew up plans for the first of several additions to the old barracks buildings, which created more dormitory space. It was not until 1879 that the police magistrate moved out of the old military hospital, allowing it to be converted into a residence for the superintendent of the asylum. In the 1870s and 1880s, several ancillary buildings, including a laundry and morgue, each interesting examples of the hospital architecture of the period, were erected along the hospital's western boundary between the old barracks buildings and New Common Street. Before overcrowding became a problem in the late 1890s, many visitors to the hospital were impressed by its wide verandas and spacious dormitories, which were well ventilated by sea breezes airing courts, fenced in areas where patients could exercise and enjoy fresh air were established in front of the male and female divisions. Mental health experts of the late 19th century emphasised the importance of providing patients with pleasurable and stimulating surroundings. This prompted Frederick Kane, hospital superintendent during the 1870s and 1880s, to develop attractive and extensive gardens in the hospital grounds. Interestingly, the superintendent involved Novocastrians excuse me, in the task of creating the gardens, calling on them to donate trees, shrubs and grapevines. There was much public interest in the construction of an elaborate fountain in the hospital grounds in 1877. By involving locals in the development of the gardens and giving them access to the hospital grounds, the superintendent appears to have reconciled many Novocastrians to the hospital's presence. A variety of local groups once again used the grounds, including the Newcastle Defence Medical Corps and the Naval Brigade. The accessibility of the grounds to various local groups represented at least a partial realisation of ambitions for turning them into a public park. So in that sense, the needs of the asylum and the city were to an extent reconciled in the 1870s and 1880s, I think it can be argued. However, from the late 1880s, the relationship between the asylum and the city became increasingly tense. The hospital's expansion in the 1880s 
resulted in the disappearance of much of the beautiful, beautiful gardens. The Newcastle Morning Herald complained in 1889 that had the Department of Lunacy not controlled the old barracks, the government would never have situated the courthouse in Church Street <coughs> facing Bolton Street, a development which thwarted long-standing hopes of extending Bolton Street to Ordnance Street. Complaints about the hospital increased during the 1880s and 1890s as the hill became a prestigious residential district. These complaints were, as I mentioned previously, motivated in part by fears of declining property values as well as prejudices against mentally ill people. The widening and raising of New Common Street in the 1890s allowed passers-by to look down into the hospital grounds, depriving patients of their privacy. Because the hospital was located well below the street, the top of the main um, chimney was almost level with the windows of houses in New Common Street. So a lot of those people who were living in that prestigious area were opening their windows and finding that smoke was coming right in. So that was another source of contention. There was also controversy in 1901 when the hospital resumed the old deanery, the parsonage, uh, that we spoke about earlier, built in 1819 for the purpose of building a reception house on the corner of New Common and Church Streets. The reception house, I think it can be described as a, uh, a precursor to the modern psychiatric clinic, was intended to house people suffering short-term mental problems. During the early 1900s, the hospital struggled with the problem of overcrowding. In 1907, it was reported to be the most crowded asylum in New South Wales. The problem was partially relieved by the transfer of patients to new facilities at Morissette and Stockton. <coughs> Just before World War I, there was an important phase of construction on this site. It resulted in the erection of a two-storey matron's residence and nurses' quarters opposite the old gatehouse on the northern side of the hospital's Watt Street entrance. The nurses' quarters is an important example of the style of building planned in the office of government architect Walter Liberty Vernon. The hospital's expansion during these years was an affront to those who continued to call for its relocation. Alderman M.C. Reid complained in 1914 that the hospital's presence was depreciating property values on the hill. Okay. Some residents claimed Reid had left the area because they found, and I quote, the horrible and offensive noises that emanate from the patients in the grounds intolerable. Mm -hmm. However, among those calling for the hospital's removal, there was little agreement about alternative uses for the site. Some wanted to convert it into a general hospital. The Chamber of Commerce proposed that it should become the headquarters of military forces in the Northern District, returning to its original military role to an extent. Alderman Reid proposed that it become the city's botanical <coughs> gardens and that eventually a museum and art gallery be erected on the site. The 1920s witnessed a major remodelling of the interior of the hospital's oldest buildings. But an announcement in 1925 by Mr William Longworth that he would donate £20,000 for the purpose of establishing a zoo and botanical gardens on the hospital site sparked renewed debate about the institution's future. The campaign to relocate the hospital gained momentum in the 1930s when the City Council and the Rotary Club joined forces to call for the site to be turned into a government precinct and botanical garden. So botanical gardens keep coming up again and again as an alternative use for the site. Had the site been developed along the lines suggested by Rotary and the Council, it's almost certain that the old barracks and officers' quarters would have been demolished. That was certainly part of the plan that was put forward. The 1930s campaign to relocate the hospital was motivated by some visionary schemes, but once again, prejudice against the mentally ill was very much apparent. When in 1936 the government announced that it had no intention of removing the hospital, and Newcastle Alderman replied that there were not enough mentally troubled people in Newcastle <laughs> to <laughs> warrant I'm such not. a facility <laughs> and that by converting the hospital's grounds into a park it would, quote, allow citizens to relax their minds from the very worries that made psychiatric clinics necessary.